The last week of January 2022, Bootstrap Farmer brought three new molds online for U.S. manufacturing. We met up at our injection molder to oversee the onboarding process, and we brought our farmer in residence Tracy Lutz along for the ride. Bootstrap Farmer's creative director Katie Russo, Tracy, and our injection molder Cal sat down to discuss the manufacturing process, plastics and agriculture, and the future of manufacturing. Hey folks, Katie, uh, the creative director for Bootstrap Farmer here, and I have Kansas Garden Guy, Tracy Lutz, and we're here with our injection molder, Cal. And we just got done touring the factory, and we have a few new products in production, so getting to see everything from the pelleted resin all the way to getting it into a machine and having a finished product. So yeah, just kind of want to go over how the tour went for you, Tracy, and maybe start picking Calvin's brain about just what goes on in this, this facility. I personally like to see this kind of stuff. It kind of gets you the behind the scenes of the products that we use for our day-to-day -day purpose. Um, it's kind of neat to see how things were injected, just to see how much plastic um, is being used in different various ways and different components that you can use to make what it takes to actually make a tray um, and actually to see the molds. I thought that was kind of cool how much they weighed. That was kind of awesome. I never would have thought they'd weigh that much and the pressure it takes to actually inject this. Uh, it was pretty amazing. So I appreciate that. Thank you for letting us see that. All right, Calvin, why don't you walk us through the injection molding process and just everything we saw on our tour? Yeah. Well, we started in the, uh, the warehouse where we bring in all of the raw material. That includes color. That includes uh, pellets, raw plastic material, and your boxes. So those are all received into the warehouse. You guys saw all the different types of plastic we, we talked out there. We we're talking about all the different applications that we, how we decide which material that we're going to use. All of the, the, all of the products that we're using right now for bootstrap, uh, it's in that polyolefin umbrella. So that means it's a polyethylene polypropylene, which is inherently FDA. I know it's very important to, to the growers. Um, and it's also really good with UV. We also put in a UV master batch into the color. So it's loaded into the color and it, uh, it, it obviously helps with, with keeping uh, UV, any, any sort of deterioration of that plastic while it's being subjected to, to high heat, high, uh, high exposure to, to UV light. So now Calvin, can you explain to, for our listeners a little bit more what they add into that resin for the UV yep. protection? Yep, a lot of times it's just carbon. So, um, and then other times it's just the color itself. So black is just inherently UV resistant. If you go into like big ag, most of the components that are on the big, big tractors, um, that are plastic, they're going to be black. And if they're not black, they've got some sort of carbon um, additive that, that's, that helps with that UV resistance. So how do you get away with it with the lighter colors then? Uh, that you know, you're talking a little bit more scientific, um, but like I said, the carbon is actually input into that, that color. Um, there's other ways of getting around it, but normally if somebody comes to me and says, this is going to be outside, I'm saying, all right, let's make it black because that's going to be the easiest way to go, go with it. But I know Bootstrap uses a lot of different colors. We he uses white, colors. white, blue, um, green, and those all have UV packages in there. So we're covered. Cool. Well, why don't you take us from when you get the bulk resin and where do you go from there mm -hmm. as far as with your products? Yep. So that goes right into our material handling stage. So we'll take a, a box of material. Um, those usually weigh around 1,500 pounds up to 2,000 pounds. We take those out to, to press side. We showed you guys where uh, the, the wand the, that had suction that went up into the press Kind of showed you how that that's fed from the box into the to the throat of the um, the press there on the on the top side. It's also where the color is is let down into. So we talked about the letdown ratios and how much color you're going to need to to put into the the shot in order to get a good homogeneous blend of whatever color you're going with. So we saw a lot of black black parts being ran out there today, but. Usually you're running about two to four percent on those color letdowns. All right, Calvin. So once the pellets are fed into that machine, what's the process after that as far as the the pressure, the temperatures? Mm -hmm. You hit two of the most 
probably the most important parts of injection molding is pressure temperature in order to be able to get that pellet into a liquid form because that's what you have to do in order to shoot it into the mold you've got to hit a certain temperature that screw is reciprocating there's different there's different sections in 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 that screw and barrel um, you got the feed section compression section on and by the time it gets to the end of that screw there's no more threads left most of the melting comes from pressure and friction and the rest of it's done by heats that's surrounded the barrel um, once you get to a, a point uh, polypropylene polyethylene usually melts around 420 degrees once you get a good melt on it it's injected into the molds um, where it's cooled um, you let it set there for you know 20 20 seconds or so opens the tool opens up it's ready for ejection automation comes down picks the part and it's put over on the conveyor belt once it hits the conveyor belt we use that conveyor as long as possible to make sure that that part is completely cool because it's so important before it gets into the box if there's any residual heats you can see some potential uh, rejects down the road so some major quality concerns if the parts that are packed into the box are still hot so we make sure that when we're setting up that conveyor system that by the time the operator has the opportunity to pick those off the conveyor that they're completely cool and set ready to go so in terms of waste how are you limiting that um, kind of explain that for us yeah there's there's a few different ways where you come by waste uh, one is is during the purging process which luckily bootstrap is really good about this because they're they're so forward thinking and and they don't want any waste which helps us in turn because if we're switching colors a lot of times you got to purge that whole barrel out so if we're running a black part right now and we're going to a, a white part a lot of times you're going to see that residual black being bled into that next part color um, Bootstrap has asked us to, hey, don't purge that out. Just let it naturally flow into it. And you've, you've seen the parts. Mm -hmm. they're, they're really cool. They turn out really neat. They, they look kind of marbled. That's one way that, that we're reducing waste. Um, and again, thankfully, we've got a great relationship and very creative people over at Bootstrap because they can use them. But on the other side, so if we do have some, some parts that are rejected, um, they're scrapped, a lot of times you have to throw those away. We don't. We, we put those into a grinder. Uh, we grind those up and get them as close to the pelletized uh, size that we're using for, on the virgin material. Virgin meaning it's straight from our supplier. And then we put that back into the system and we run about 20% per shot. So we, we try to capitalize on that not only, well, not only for, for the fact of we don't want to be wasteful, but it's also, it helps our profitability. We, you know, we've got material there. It's going to be good material. You melt it down just like you're going to melt the new stuff down, right? So you might as well be able to use it. Uh, so we try to, as much as possible, use about 20% of our reprocess. If you go above that threshold, a lot of times you're going to see some, some uh, quality concerns mm -hmm. down the road. Um, a lot of color issues. So normally when we're running regrind, it's going into a black part. Makes sense. <clears throat> And you saw those trays. Those are pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah, I think those are my, those are my favorite by far, the purge trays. Kind of reminiscent of a tie-dye. Yeah. yeah, it kind of has a 70s tie-dye vibe yeah. to it. For sure does. And every color is different. Every shot's different. So you never know what it, it's kind of like the box of chocolates, right? You never, <laughs> yeah, you never, you never know what you're going to get. So yeah. they're pretty cool. Anytime we have people come in, we always have people asking, hey, can you do this? Well, it's, it's just not possible to do it every time. So it's kind of cool. We've got those limited editions that we send over to Bootstrap every so often. And, and, uh, we're turn just out cooking up neat. what we're going to do with them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Calvin, I have a question for you. As a farmer myself, um, and to bury down from like a small backyard farmer to a commercial farmer, I know with the varieties of uh, vegetables or fruits or any flowers or anything we grow, sometimes you get life gives you imperfection. So you either get a tomato that's out of round or one that's a little cat faced or something like that. How do you guys deal with that in your trays? If you have any type of imperfections, if any at all, I'm sure you have some, how do you guys deal with that? Yep. Yep. So, well, I would, I would take that question and, and take it back to you of, of what do you do of, of a, of a, you know, if you've got a tomato that's 
that you're not able to sell on the market or um or use at all what what do you guys do do you, you guys try to reuse it right right of course you <clears throat> right would. yeah of right. course you're going to try so to you either it. compost it or, or use it for yourself or something like right that. right and they taste they taste they exactly. taste great right so we try to do that I can draw that line to the same thing when we talk about the regrind and, and putting that back into the process. So we try to use as much as possible. Can we use it on every product? No. So you're not going to sell an out around tomato to, to Walmart, right? right. Um, or whoever you're selling right, to. Right. They want the prettiest, they want the shiniest. Well, we've got some products that we can, that we can have that, that aren't, you know, we call them um, a surface uh, components, meaning, you know, this isn't going to be on the, on the, inside of your car it's going to be hidden it's going to be somewhere where nobody's ever going to see it but it functions just as well mm -hmm. right so we we try to uh, it's a great analogy actually thinking back on it it's, it's using as much waste as you can using it uh where you can and making sure that you're talking to your customers to see can we utilize this because not only is it more you know it, it helps our profitability but a lot of times you know you can't even you can't get the plastic, right? So right. as much as we can use that's in-house and the less we have to bring in, the better. And I know that's important to, uh, to growers, to, uh, from anybody, from, you know, like I said, you can state it from like backyard growers to a commercial standpoint is, um, you know, waste is with everyone, whether it's our waste as in uh, vegetable waste or anything like that, yours would be of plastics, of course. But that's important to all of us because, you know, using so much plastic, it, it, it would be the, a great world if we didn't have to use plastic. But unfortunately, that's not our world. We have to have plastics. Um, so to see the least amount of waste that possible is important to a lot of us. Do we try to recycle a lot from, you know, the trays, these trays that last 6, 10, 12, 15 years, you know, um, that, that's saving a lot of plastic of the, the cheaper style trays that you can right. get on the market right now. So um, I thank you for that because that's something that everyone is striving to do is to try yep. to be the best person they can, the best grower they can, the best manufacturer possibly you can, the best company, you know, providing these products for us, you know, so, so that, that's pretty good. I, I, I like that. I like to see that. Yeah, it's funny. You know, plastics is a bad word to a lot of people, yeah. right? Um, however, you know. It's not the case. If you go out and talk to any manufacturer, any injection molder in the United States that's doing this for their living, I'm going to tell you that they're probably the most resourceful people out there. And they're the last ones that want to drive down the road and see plastic bags on the side of the road. Um, we're the ones that are trying to, we're all fighting the same fight, right? We want to get to where, you know, this is a cleaner world. And we're going to be able to do that through plastics. There's, there's so many technologies that are coming out. There's, um, you know, biodegradables. There's, there's all kinds of stuff that we can look at doing. But Bootstrap is doing that in their own way, right? Just like you said, they're not, they're not selling these trays that are one-time uses anymore. They're, they're selling trays that, are, that, that they've got longevity. They've, they're going to be able to be in the world for a long, long time and produce really good products. So, and from a customer service aspect, <clears throat> we are going to have some that may have some imperfections and that's really where we're, we're kind of still learning there's kind of that human mm -hmm. aspect there that this is this is new for us moving to usa manufacturing you know with, with as many products as we've been able to um and it's kind of a learning curve but there just is having that hands-on being able to correct it with there's always human error in anything we do in any industry you deal with i mean you, you you know, doctors make mistakes all the time, right? And they're the smartest people on the earth. You, you probably make that argument. Uh, but we're going to have, we're going to have human error here. I mean, there, there's going to be times that parts get out that, that shouldn't be getting out and that get to your customers. And every time that happens, we hear about it. Trust me. I mean, we, we try, we strive for zero parts per million reject, right? So that's an industry term, zero PPM. That, that's what we strive for. That's what everybody strives for. Um, and unfortunately it's just not, it's not 100% achievable. Nobody's perfect. Nobody can do this to the point of, you know, we do our operators out there are humans just like everybody else. They come to work. Sometimes they have a really tough night. Maybe they've got a newborn that they're, they've been up all night with. They're showing up at, at 6am after they've been up from 12 to four. I've done it. I've made, made those mistakes. So, um, 
it does happen. It's unfortunate, but we always try to make it better in the end. And um, every time we do make a mistake, it's just another learning curve for us. And we, we make sure that we put more parameters in that to make sure it never happens. I like that. I like that a lot. And I think that that just kind of sums it up why we love how much we've been able to personalize our products, personalize the customer experience, and just having our hands in how everything's made. Just kind of that transparency we're able to get from having it. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, this is Bootstrap's facility, just like it's mine, right? So um, if, if Nick or anybody from the Bootstrap family showed up, um, knocked on the door, they might as well have keys because they're, they're able to come in and see what's going on. I like how it personalizes everything. You know, it's almost like, like when I use these trays, you know, especially after today, after this is my first time being here, you know, I've obviously I've seen the, the photos and stuff like that and some videos and stuff, but it almost personalizes it like it's yours. So like if you go home and you're grabbing a tray and you're using it, you know, you can say, I remember when I saw that getting made or whatever. And it's almost like, well, that's my tray. You know, that's how you feel. You almost feel like you're a part of that family where I think nowadays with a lot of companies, they're, they're way too big and everything's kind of not personalized and you don't feel like you belong, you know, and, and when you pick up a trade, yeah, you put harder money into it. You know, it may not be, you know, a lot of money to some people. It may be a million dollars to somebody. You don't know everybody's personal experience or their background or, or what they're, you know, what they're capable of having. So, I mean, every time you invest, you're investing into bootstrap farmer you're not investing into a tray you know you're investing into a company and then you know with hundreds and hundreds of farmers you know this is a big thing now especially you know after you know the pandemic we've had for the last couple of years you know there's a lot more people into growing their own food or caring about where their food comes from and this is a opportunity this is showing you a company that's that's stepping up and investing into their farmers you know, whether it costs more. Yeah, you could do this for a lot cheaper. You know, I mean, you could literally not make these trays as strong or not make them like you can make them last one season. I mean, there's plenty of trays on the market right now that you could use one time and throw away. It's just plastic. You know, the guy sitting in the company that's making the money is not thinking about that on the, and he may be, but you know, once that tray leaves their facility and it goes to a farm or a store or whatever, you know, it's kind of out of his mind because there's more of them being made, you know, whether that tray ends up being in the dump or ends up being somebody's trash can on their farm, it doesn't really ultimately matter to them. You know, I feel like and the reason why I, I, you know, I like putting myself with your guys' company is because it makes me feel like it's part mine. You know, like I'm invested into it as much as anyone else. I may not be invested on the tooling side or, you know, shaking hands with you aside or buying plastics, but this is my tray. You know, this is the one that I bought is my tray. And it's always going to be my tray. I love looking at, all the social media. I, I can't, I've never looked at as many plants as I have. <laughs> I've, I've looked at more plants in the last two years than I have my entire life. It's super cool though. Cause I, it's the same, pers different perspective, but same for me. Right. So I, I get a, I get to see these people on YouTube. I get to see these people on Instagram growing these fantastic looking plants, um, these microgreens and knowing truly I, I watched, you know, I, I, I helped develop this with, with bootstrap. I, I, I've been out on the floor. I've, I've watched, watched it be processed. Um, and it is really, really cool. I love doing that with all my customers. A lot of times I don't get that visibility, mm -hmm. but with bootstrap, you know, they're always reposting you know, their customers reactions and, and, um, uh, successes of, of what they're doing with these, with these components. And it's, I absolutely love just watching people using our trays yeah. and just seeing how having something that is going to last for a long time. And they're usually, they're usually really excited about the investment they've made into them. They're like, I upgraded to the tray <laughs> and it's, it's something to celebrate. I think we kind of lost that when we, not to get on a soapbox, but just thinking about getting, getting a car off the line in Detroit, you know, and just how personal that was versus when you don't see things made, um, just with a small yeah. farm movement, you're seeing things grow. You're knowing your farmer. I just, I really, I think that appeals to a lot of people. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. And you could go down the line and say the same thing about manufacturing, right? It is such a cool time to see all the manufacturing coming back to the United States. Um, 
just in the past two years, we've been able to add 10 jobs, 10 good paying jobs here in a small town, just from the growth of manufacturing being shifted from overseas back to the United States. And it is personal. It is, it is really cool seeing the impact that we're able to make on these people's lives. As a consumer, I am completely on board with paying a couple extra dollars if that means that it created a job here in the United States or just just having that knowledge that it was made here. Well, Tracy, the reason that we had you here and we're so excited is we've got three new products, three brand new tools that just came in um, that, that we're starting production on. First one is the 1020 deep mesh right here. Um, super cool tool. Uh, very. It, I think that thing weighed about 12,000 pounds coming in. So it's a two cavity, massive tool um, that will be in production this week. Uh, we've also got the six cell that we're super excited about. That is in production. We got all kinds of footage today on it. Uh, wanted to see kind of what you guys were thinking about these. And my favorite, to be completely honest with you, it's a beautiful tool. I'm going to geek out a little <laughs> bit about it. Um, it. When it opened up, I got the photo photo last night and I was. Uh, I was at dinner and I was like, man, that is, that is just a pretty looking tool. Um, all the, all the cores and, and, um, steel work on it is just fantastic. 72 cell airframe tray. We are so excited to, to be in production on this for you guys. Um, and it looks like a little bit of ingenuity on the six cell yep. that kind of combined the, um, the design of that air prune. Um, onto the six cell, so that's pretty neat too. Had had quite a bit of engineering on on making sure that we can get those slits in there without any sort of uh, um, flash that that would prevent any sort of uh, airflow through there. So just want to get your feedback, what you, what you thought overall. You know, you could stack your pots in here. You could stack your six packs in here if you wanted to do that route. Um, basically, you could use it as a strainer. You could grow microgreens in it. You could grow. Uh, Soil blocks in it. Uh, we talked about that earlier. That's something you can put soil blocks in and then put in the bottom of the tray. Um, these six packs are pretty amazing. Um, and all of us are pretty familiar with the six pack. You know, everybody sells a six pack style. The difference is, is the quality and the feel in your hand. The fitment in your hand feels good. I like. I think I saw somebody standing on one earlier. <laughs> yeah, somebody standing <laughs> on one. I like, the, um, I like the bigger hole on the bottom. You can stick your finger through that. Uh, a lot of places will. That's where they'll skimp on it. They'll, you know, with the dye and stuff. I love that it has the, uh, guess who that, I love that it has the air prune in it. Um, so I think that's going to make a lot of people excited. The air pruning is a big deal. Um, but like I said, once again, the quality of this is, is pretty amazing. Um, I love that. I love it's got the, you know, it's got the Made in the USA on it and the, the BP label on it. Now this bad boy right here is the one everybody's going to be waiting. This air prune tray is pretty Pretty cool look. I like the design of it, the difference of it. Here, Katie, I'm just gonna steal it from you. We'll grab. And the hole on the back side here that you can actually stick your whole finger through. That's pretty amazing. You can get the starts out here. And the air prune design also, also has the air prune slots in it also. So it'll make for a healthier transplant. It's built like a tank. It, it is built it, like it, a tank. I want to run over it with my truck. I, I just want to see how well, much I don't, weight this I don't, is Don't hold. do that. I don't want you to hurt your truck. <laughs> I don't want you to hurt your truck. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is a pretty ingenious tray. I like this. Um, yeah, I think these are going to be, these are, this is what I'm excited about is this one right here. Get my hands on this one. Yeah, I know there's been a lot of talk about it and, and we finally got to a point of, of you know, Bootstrap finally felt comfortable about, about placing it with us. So, um, like I said, I was super happy to have that thing finally show up. It's been a long, long time coming. So we're, we're super excited to have that in production. We're so excited to see how that does. All right, Cal, earlier you were talking about some new technologies coming out. What, what were you referring to, even if it's not in the near future? Yeah. Well, the, the cool part about the relationship that I have with Bootstrap is they're very open-minded and um, we do some stuff for the airlines that we actually put antimicrobials into the uh, serving trays that they use on airlines. Uh, not only is it antimicrobial, but it, it is also um, antibacterial, antifungal. It, th that all falls under antimicrobial. So I know that's, I've heard you guys talk about that being an issue um, in growing, you know, fungi being, being an issue. Um, so I, I would like to bring that up to, to bootstrap and, and see maybe down the, 
down the line in the future, um, if that's something that can can really help the growers out in the future. So uh, the problem with that is the you know the cost compared to the results. So we got to see where that where that lands and what you know how much of the customer base is, is you know how much are you going to order, right? So the more you order, the cheaper it gets. If I order fifty pounds of something, it's going to be twenty bucks a pound. If I order ten thousand we can get that down, you know, to, to a dollar range or something like that. And I'm just throwing numbers out right. there just to, to throw them out there. But it's technologies like that, that I'm, I'm trying to keep in front of bootstrap to see if there is something there. Cause they're always on the front line. It seems of, Hey, what are we doing next? It's not, Hey, how's production going? Or, Hey, do you have those parts? It's, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this in a couple of years. So that's, that's the kind of customer I love aligning, uh, aligning with because I know that there's going to be a long, long relationship there because they're always pushing those lines. Of, and that's what creates success, right? That's what creates a strong company and a, a good part in the end of it, good, good product. So picturing a future of antimicrobial uh, microgreen trays, would you get on board with that? Yeah, I would be on board with that. <laughs> and, and I think like what Calvin was saying was um, – you know, what we were talking, kind of touched on earlier, but there's a, there's, Bootstrap Farmer's not the only company doing this. There's other companies, of course, we all know that. Um, I think, you know, I align myself with companies that are, that are, you know, future takers, that are risk takers, that are willing to invest into stuff. And this is, what, you know, what we're doing right here. Pioneers. Best. Pioneers, yeah, exactly. And so you start throwing, you know, antifungal and, and stuff like that into these trays. Well, everybody fights with, you know, dampening off or everybody fights with microgreens. You may get some, um, some mold in your sunflowers. I mean, I do that. I fight sunflower microgreens. I all the time, you know, I just want to throw them out the window. I mean, I, some people love growing them and I can't grow them. You know, it's like I fight that stuff. So even if then it's not going to take it out hundred percent, you know, because you've got humidity, you've got, you know, the way you grow and stuff like that. But I think if you can give it a fighting chance, you know, if you can throw, throw more, you know, people into the team there. I think that, that that's something that people would invest into. I think that's something people like. You know, people want something that's less hard. You you know, I mean, if if one thing if one thing that you could take off your plate is um maybe not um well, here's a topic. We talked about the kind of touched on this earlier is, is cleaning of microgreen trays. That uh. seems to be something that is literally like a political question in the world. It's like <laughs> it's like people literally will have fights about this kind of thing, you know, about, well, do you clean your microgreen trays? How many times do you sanitize it? Oh, I brush it and then I sanitize it. Then I bleach it. Then I throw it in the sun and then we do all this, but then you don't sanitize the dirt in the garden before you grow in it. So it's like, how often should I sanitize this? Now, maybe I'm not saying this is scientifically true. I mean, I don't know. I'm just a guy growing tomatoes. It's all theoretical. Exactly. So maybe this would help on cleaning the trays more where instead of having to take a brush and, you know, scrub these each, you know, and then sanitize it and then bleach it and then UV it or whatever you got to do to get it. Maybe well, Tracy, it's just washing it. I'm going to interrupt you real quick too, because this, this was the big sell for, for our customer was, okay, you've got somebody cleaning it. We talked about human error before, right? I was, okay. So I, I assume not all farmers are perfect, right? Right. Okay. So are they no, going to, are they, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 Present company excluded. <laughs> um, you know, they're going to miss some spots. Right. So is that little spot going to cost you 10 bucks down the road? Maybe. I, I don't know. And, and that's, that's, you know, that's the stuff that we need to figure out is um, you know, what, what kind of increase in efficiencies can we get from adding this? Uh, so maybe, maybe that's coming. I don't know. Uh, maybe, you know, they, there is some shown interest um, to, to see where it goes. But I know there's a lot of studies and a lot of tests that need to be you know, right. conducted before we're, you know, selling antimicrobial <laughs> microgreen trays. I feel as a whole, as a company, we're always looking to empower growers and just just kind of set the the playing field a little bit more even, I guess. Mm -hmm. If that even makes sense. But we're we're giving growers equipment where they're starting at a good spot. They're not working against something. Mm -hmm. And that's always you know, we're giving them better drainage. We're giving them, you know, more structure stability with our equipment. Your farmer's success rate, it is a clear indication of your success rate, 
right? Yeah. So if your farmers are happy with, with your trays and it's giving them a competitive edge in the market, I mean, you guys are going to do really well with it. I think my dad actually told my husband the other day, um, he's an old farmer, and he said, Andy, you're only as, you're only as good as, as the equipment you have. You know, and that really, obviously there's a lot of, you know, determination and, you know, right. consistency right. there. But if you, if you start with good tools for the job, that makes a really big difference. Yeah, somebody said that about my golf game and it didn't work. <laughs> 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 I'm still really bad at golf <laughs> and have really expensive equipment. <laughs> no, but you're absolutely right. I mean, this is the... It's a direct analogy to, to what we're talking about here. Thank you for all of you farmers who have supported us over the years to make this investment possible. It's crystal clear now what your support means as it ripples through the U.S. economy, and we are committed to increasing those investments and pushing new innovation on your behalf. If you like this video's inside look, share it in your groups and community. As you have seen in the last few months, this is a very slow and expensive process. The more you can share, the more it helps us out, and more U.S. products can become available for everyone. There's a lot more of these conversations on the way, so please hit that subscribe button and follow us at Bootstrap Farmer across all platforms and check out our podcast. And now for the bloopers. All right, well, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll be, we'll be touching on some of these topics throughout the next couple weeks. Uh, and please leave reviews. We'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you might just need to do the ending because I'm just He's awkward. good at that. He's just... Yeah. Yeah. Comment below on what you'd like us to cover on the next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Smash that like button. Okay. <laughs> I like yeah. your socks. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, this is some HR stuff I'm going to have to report to the boss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I need 10 seconds to silence the page. All right, Calvin, why don't you walk us through the injection mold and... <laughs> You're fine. I think you slipped up there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just on it. I was going to be a reporter. <laughs> if you just combine them, it's right. KC Cal. Awesome. <clears throat> if you liked what you heard and some of the topics that we covered, be sure to let us know in the comments. Hard stop. Was that a hard stop? Was it good? Or should I? Uh, okay. If you liked what you heard and some of the topics that we covered, be sure to comment in the comment section and we'll <laughs> read them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. Okay. I lost it. <laughs> snip, snap, snip, snap. <laughs> I'm hungry. I think you just need to feed me. That's why. <laughs> we'll see you on the flipping. <laughs> we'll, we'll read them. There's going to be some TikTok dance in the background. <laughs>